Boss, we need to talk. Is something wrong? I'm not sure. Did you set up a private access route to bypass the company firewall right before you hired me? Like <laughs> what? Pritchard said someone's been using it to access our system since before the first attack. The security measures he and I set in place never stopped them because we didn't even know the loophole existed. Oh, I see. Frank's fixed that, though, right? He has now, but he's wondering why you never mentioned it. Frank's paranoid, Adam. You know that. Can a busy man forget things once in a while? David Sarif is the founder of Sarif Industries and is Adam Jensen's employer during the events of Deus Ex Human Revolution. Um, by the time the events of Deus Ex Mankind divided, he's invested in other companies after his own went bankrupt. David Sarif is the founder and CEO of Sarif Industries, a moderately sized biotechnology company based in North America. He is a well-preserved male in his late 50s of average height and build and decent shape. His features are somewhat Mediterranean. The son of an immigrant family from Boston, Sarif was brought up to understand the value of hard work and dedication, and from an early age, his insight into machines set the tone for the man he would become. He worked his way through university and from there to a scholarship at MIT, getting an MBA before entering the prosthetics field. Sarif believes in justice, progress, science and technology, civilization, human endeavor and people. He is direct when dealing with others and unafraid to show emotion. Some find him blunt or pushy, others find him refreshing or even invigorating. His sense of honesty applies only to his behavior. He has no aversion to keeping secrets when appropriate, especially in the business context. In 2007, David Sarif promised to revitalize his home city of Detroit by introducing a new industry of mechanical augmentation to the city, refitting disused automobile plants for the production of mechanical augmentations for military and civilian use. Sarif had nearly single-handedly revitalized the economy of the city and prevented its collapse. During this time, he became close friends of Hugh Darrow, who was a mentor of sorts to Sarif and the father of mechanical augmentation. Sarif has a sister and a niece named Natalie and Nina Freeman, respectively. Nina is kidnapped in issue one of the Deus Ex Human Revolution comic series, and it is there revealed that Natalie is the vice president's and president and staunch supporter of the Humanity Front. So, um, dealing with his appearances in the game Deus Ex Human Revolution, um, Sarif was preparing for the augmentation debate in Washington when a Black Ops team, the Tyrants, attacked Sarif Industries HQ in Detroit and killed several scientists, including the company's top researcher, Megan Reed, and Adam Jensen, the Sarif Industries Chief of Security. Sarif opted to save Jensen and arranged for him to be mechanically augmented. While only Adam's left arm and chest cavity needed to be augmented in order to save his life, Sarif decided as Jensen's medical proxy, thanks to a convenient employment contract clause, to replace most of Jensen's body with cybernetic prosthetics. Six months later, he pulled Jensen out of sick leave when an extremist anti-augmentation group known as Purity Fist, Purity, Purity First, sorry, attacked the Milwaukee manufacturing plant just as the typhoon explosive system a top secret military augmentation was about to enter production he sent jensen in to secure the data before it was made public and to rescue any and all hostages where possible upon jensen's return sarif had him retrieve the neural hub of the augmented purity first hacker from the detroit police department morgue implying that adam either use old contacts to get inside or to sneak in after this, he tasked Jensen with disabling the transmitter in Derelict Row District that kept the back door into the SI network open that Sarif himself had created and neither Jensen nor Frank Pritchard were aware of. Once the signal was shut down, Sarif sent Jensen to investigate where the source of the hacker's signal came from, an abandoned bot factory complex in Highland Park. After Jensen discovered the secret FEMA detention facility and defeated Lawrence Barrett, Sarif had a meeting with William Taggart before sending Jensen to Hengsha to find the hacker, but diverted him to Juarez to save his niece from augmented captors. After a successful rescue, Sarif tried to reconcile with his niece and her mother, a high-ranking member of the Humanity Front, but was rejected. In the aftermath of an attack on the Humanity Front rally in Detroit, Sarif sent Jensen to Montreal to follow a hacker's trace that led him to Katrina Sutherland, 
in London, Serif had another meeting with William Taggart and a third person, Zhao Yun Ru. Three appeared to have a history together, and the latter two revealed considerable knowledge of the trouble Serif Industries had endured and offered Serif the chance to work with them rather than oppose them. Serif immediately rejected this offer, knowing it to be a conspiracy. On the way back to Detroit, Serif and Jensen were attacked by Quincy Durant, Jensen's former SWAT commander and the mastermind of the attack on Humanity Front in Detroit. The ordeal eventually led to the death of Katrina Sutherland. Jensen continued his original mission to Hengsha, where he found out the scientists lost in the attack six months ago were alive, and then headed to Montreal to confront Eliza Kassan. When he returned to Detroit in the midst of heavy riots, Saraf warned him about the conspiracy. After a personal meeting with Hugh Darrow, Saraf sent Jensen back to Hengsha to find one of the missing scientists. While Jensen disappeared, Saraf departed to Detroit to visit Panchea, where Hugh Darrow had gathered several political and corporate leaders to unveil the installation before activating the biochip that drove augmented people around the world crazy, making them hallucinate and commit violent acts. Saraf was not affected and was able to barricade himself inside the facility's submarine bay with other survivors. When Jensen finds him, Saraf admitted to his part in using Adam's DNA for development purposes. He also asked Adam to alter Darrow's recorded message to the world, framing Humanity Front for tampering with the distributed biochips. But when questioned by Adam, Saraf retreats and says he knows Adam will make the right choice. Following the org incident, the world plunged into chaos and society turned against augmented people, causing most of the augmentation industry to crash. While recovering in a hospital after Panchea was destroyed, Sarif's fortune and dreams crashed with it. Having to declare bankruptcy, his company was finally absorbed by Tai Yong Medical, the only augmentation company to survive this aftermath. So moving forward a couple of years to the time of Deus Ex Mankind Divided. So in 2029, Sarif is an older wiser and slightly more reserved version of the man he was before he's still wealthy and still direct when dealing with others and still believes in progress science and technology and human endeavor he also continues to hold on to an idealistic belief in a mechanically enhanced mankind however he has learned to be patient and let others carry the banner into the spotlight for him for now after the Ruzhika station bombing in Prague, Seraf sent a message to Jensen, resuming contact with him after two years of silence. Despite falling on hard times after the org incident, he is doing better than others and is traveling to London to become part of a group of investors for an innovative company that wants to make renewable energy. After Jensen learns about his hidden augments, Seraf will be surprised to know about them and is adamant that he never had any hidden augments installed in Jensen. However, after Jensen reveals the Neodymium shield, Saraf recognizes it as a Titan org, an experimental augment the DOD had asked him about years ago as they valued his opinion. He further reveals the designer behind it, a Vadim Orlov. Saraf then takes it upon himself to help Jensen, having felt things did not end right between them a couple of years ago. He eventually learns through contacts that Orlov had been visiting Prague around the same time Jensen started working there and passes this information on to Jensen. However, when Jensen learns that Orlov had been killed, Seraf decides to look for more uh, answers and finds out that the facility Jensen was at never reported him being there. Furthermore, he reveals to Jensen that it should have been relatively easy to identify him, even if Jensen did not know who he was because of the serial numbers on his augments. In the end, Seraph was not able to dig up any more useful information and tells Jensen to make of it what he will. An overheard conversation between two guests at the Apex Center states that Seraph has been recently hired by Nathaniel Brown. They do not mention in what capacity, but do state surprise that he isn't present at the convention. Um, so we know that Sarif has his um, also augmentations. So he has two main augmentations. One is a CASIE social enhancer, a CASI, which has some discrete grooves on his forehead, um, and a very ornate mechanical right arm. He is said to have had his arm replaced with an augmentation so he could play better baseball at the company picnic. It is fair to assume that all of his augmentations have come from his own company, Sarif Industries. He also appears to have an EMP shield org, as he does not react if you throw an EMP grenade at him on Panchea. Um, 
never tried that. Um, he may also have others, however, this cannot be confirmed. As of mankind divided, his left arm now also appears to be augmented, um, as well as uh, or as seen via gesticulation during his initial vid call of Jensen. This is assumed to be a result of injuries, uh, injuries sustained during the org incident and explosion of Panchea. Um, so the following is the Casey Social Enhancer Summary of David Sarris. So under personality traits it is listed as aggressive, excitable and envious. Um, and his psychological profile says um, has a tendency to shift blames onto others but will back down rapidly if resistance is felt. Is not afraid to use his authority to get his way and doesn't like to be defied. Or sometimes change the subject in order to win an argument. Um, Sarif wrote an article called Building Wings A Better Tomorrow, which highlights his personal beliefs regarding transhumanism. It can be seen as a contrast to William Taggart's No Better, The Myth of Human Augmentation. Um, and that's pretty much all we have on David Sarif. The rest is trivia, so we'll get into the trivia and then we can get to some of our own thoughts after that. So the first trivia is you can find Sarif's portrait in his office that pictures him with both hands augmented. In the game, however, Seraf is shown with only his right hand augmented visibly. This most likely means that the development team had Seraf's character model uh, originally have two robotic arms when they made the painting, but later in development decided to change his character model to just have the one robotic arm and forgot about the painting. But that is interesting because he does eventually end up with two in the next game. So Yeah, it could have been the original um, plan um, for him that, and potentially showing forward writing. Yeah. Just a, a small miss off, but I, I'll let them. I'll let them off on that one. I think um, the chess set on Sarah's desk is actually a real chess set called the Mancini chess set. For those of you that know about chess sets, David Sarnoff may be the historical prototype for David Seraf. Yeah. So David Sarnoff um, was a, um, a Russian kind of American businessman and one of the pioneers of American radio and television back in the day. Um, so he worked for RCA, which is a very famous radio corporation of America. He was um, contemporaries of like Einstein and um, what's his name? He was the guy that invented the light bulb, Thomas Edison and that and that lot, you know, around that same time. Um, Sarif is an Arabic personal name meaning noble or highborn, and is commonly used by both Arabs and non-Arab Muslims. Um, it is also a hon homonym, so another way of spelling. The word Seraph, which we know is the highest class of angel. Seraph is arguably an analogous to the real analogous, world Henry, analogous. analogous to the real world Henry Ford. Um, just like Ford, Seraph is a Michigan native who, through his own industry, was responsible for a significant number of innovations on his home turf and tries to bring a product once strictly regarded as a luxury. Um, so, in this case, automobiles versus augmentations to the regular masses. Um, David Tariff is a Detroit Tigers fan. Uh, you can actually see this by looking at the wall behind him in his office. It shows stats for that season. You can also be seen throwing a baseball up and down and toys with it when he is agitated or uncomfortable. Sarif shares similar similarities with Damien Knight of Ares Marco Technology from the Shadowrun series, um, both CEOs of a powerful mega corporation specializing in weapons and augmentation. Uh, and both of their headquarters are based in Detroit. When the player encounters Sarif in Panchea, he will not be affected by Darrow's signal and nor will he be affected by the EMP grenades as previously mentioned. He can also apparently be killed on Panchea, but this is non-canon and doesn't affect the story at all, which I, I didn't even know. I didn't know you could kill him, other than if you failed to go save him, so that's, that's interesting. Definitely multiple replay values of this game. So that's all of our trivia as well, so I guess a bit of our little chit chat at the end. Um, and I guess I'll start by saying that he's actually one of my favourite kind of side characters in, from both um, modern games. Um, uh, what, I, what I like about him in Human Revolution is that you're never really sure whether you can actually trust him or not and whether he's kind of involved in some kind of conspiracy himself or not. Obviously reading through this you get the idea, you know, you, you see that he actually rejects going in with, um, I think it's Darrow, is it Darrow and um, Zhao Yunru? Oh no, William Taggart, sorry, and Zhao Yunru from um, from Taiyong Medical, so he rejects a chance for a conspiracy. And basically, I think that now that I've, we've gone through this research, 
it actually seems to me like someone that knows about it and resisted it and ultimately that kind of proved to be a bit of a downfall of his um that he should if he'd have jumped on board that he probably would have done a lot better and his company never would have gone under um but because he didn't that's why a lot of things happened to him like he lost his company basically because of it but yeah on the flip side it just goes to show that he is um in this sense a human character he's very he's a lot more believable um he's sort of more trustworthy than some of the others but still in the moment without knowing all of the truths he, he he's much like some of the other characters where you don't know if he's entirely trustworthy but um i guess in hindsight you can see that yeah he, he sort of was um and again i guess that just makes for what much more interesting character writing he's not just an obvious villain or or um, hero character like he, he is your boss but he also has his own agendas and personality and things like that yeah his um his character model and his voice actor actually changed between human revolution and mankind divided and whilst graphically it's you know it's a lot better obviously in mankind divided being a newer game i actually preferred the character both the character model and the voice actor in human revolution yeah i thought i thought the voice actor had sort of a gravelly nature and the accent to it very very well um and this character model actually is a, looking a bit more like a mid to late 50s character whereas in mankind divided he looks like about 40 you know he looks a lot younger um whilst it's not completely unbelievable it, i don't know i just i like the idea of him being a mid to late 50s kind of kind of a bit more not grizzled but you know he's got this gravelly voice to him he's a bit more i don't know he's a bit more realistic in, in my opinion yeah, agreed. I, I really do like him in, in the first game much more. Um, and honestly, as a character, he is definitely one of the most interesting, um, even in comparison to, as you say, some of the more recent games, um, or even in movies and stuff like that. He's, he's more interesting than a lot of other characters, even though he's technically not, you know, he's not like a main character, but he is a, he is a pretty close supporting character. Um, and they did make him really, really interesting. So big fan of him. Absolutely. All right, well, unless you've got anything else you want to add? No, I don't really have much more to say on him at the moment. Um, we've sort of gone through all the lore there is on him so far. Um, obviously, there's a lot of sort of reading to go through if we wanted to, but I think this is a really good summary of, of everything that needs to be said. Absolutely. So um, stick around the channel. Uh, if you want some more Deus Ex lore videos, they will be coming. Um, it's a little bit s slower at the moment um, due to, um, should I say, I haven't finished Mankind Divided totally yet, so I'm actually trying to not do too much research to not spoil the game for myself, yep. um, and I think likewise for you, but yep. that should be finished um, soon and we can start pumping out some more Deus Ex lore videos just to help fill in the time also between now and uh, the next great cyberpunk game series hopefully that comes out. Yep, so hopefully uh, we'll see you once we have some more to talk about in the Deus Ex Law universe. See you. Seraph was right about one thing. It's in our nature to want to rise above our limits. Think about it. We were cold, so we harnessed fire. We were weak, so we invented tools. Every time we met an obstacle, we used creativity and ingenuity to overcome it. The cycle is inevitable. But will the outcome always be good? I guess that will depend on how we approach it. These past few months, I was challenged many times. But more often than not, didn't I try to keep morality in mind, knowing that my actions didn't have to harm others? Time and time again, didn't I resist the urge to abuse power and resources simply to achieve my goals more swiftly? In the past, we've had to compensate for weaknesses, finding quick solutions that only benefit a few. But what if we never need to feel weak or morally conflicted again? What if the path Seraph wants us to take enables us to hold on to higher values with more stability? One thing is obvious. For the first time in history, we have a chance to steal fire from the gods. To turn away from it now, to stop pursuing a future in which technology and biology combine, leading to the promise of a singularity 
would mean to deny the very essence of who we are. No doubt the road to get there will be bumpy, hurting some people along the way. But won't achieving the dream be worth it? We can become the gods we've always been striving to be. We might as well get good at it.